welcome to Games as Lit 101. Last week, we talked about the projection protagonist, and how it's used as a vessel for the player to project themselves into the story and world of the game they're playing. This week, we're talking about the other kind of protagonist in video games, the independent protagonist, which doesn't offer itself up to as much of the player's own definition of the character. In a way, this concept actually doesn't need any introduction. At its heart, the independent protagonist is the same kind of character we see in literally every other storytelling medium out there. While some form of the projection protagonist has tended to exist in linear art forms, the lack of interactivity keeps it from being quite the same as it is in video games. But all characters, even poorly developed ones, usually have to have some kind of definition. So in movies, plays, books, all sorts of art forms, that definition is of course given by the story itself. The independent protagonist is just that same principle that we're used to. So while the core concept remains the same, some of the details surrounding it change a bit. After all, we're not just watching a character do things or reading about their decisions, we're actually put into their shoes in such a way that we identify with them, even to the point where we talk about decisions that they made and things that they did in the story in the first person when talking about a game that we played. But while we identify with the main character, we aren't actually defining them ourselves, which can make it so the story of a video game could play out much like in any other medium, or it could also actually make for some interesting conflict between our interests and the protagonists if a game knows how to play its cards right. One common variation on this kind of protagonist is basically designed to accommodate the player's actions by making the protagonist's personality and choices simple or relatable, so there's not really a reason to disagree with their actions. Halo is an example of this one. While John isn't the most fleshed out character in the world, he's generally fighting against enemies that make sense to fight against, and any of the questionable decisions he makes tend to be thrust upon him, either by the severity of the situation or by Cortana's reasoning, which he's predisposed to obeying, really, due to his soldier conditioning and Cortana's similarity to his mother figure, Dr. Halsey. Uh, one could even say his- Okay, okay, sorry, started geeking out there a bit. I'll wait on the Halo analysis until it's an inevitable episode. Point is, games like this generally rely on the player not questioning the actions of the protagonist. So the good ones, at least, are usually written in such a way that the protagonist's actions make enough sense that the player isn't going to be at odds with what the game is telling them to do. But some games make things a bit more complicated. Shadow of the Colossus starts off as a simple story of a boy doing a favor for a higher being in hopes of resurrecting someone close to him. I won't ruin the ending, because for the love of God, just go play Shadow of the Colossus already, but as the game goes on, we start questioning whether this course of action is good for the boy, or even for the world. But we don't have the option of leaving, because the boy wouldn't do that. He's committed to his goal, even if it brings him ruin in the process. So basically, we have this interesting combination of the player's will and the character's. The player won't necessarily understand or agree with the actions of the protagonist, but they have to do it anyway, because the player isn't defining who this character is and what they do. This has the interesting effect of making us more closely examine the actions of this character, because we're going to need to bring ourselves to do those actions as well. Now, some would consider this detrimental to storytelling in a video game, but I think that's kind of a nearsighted way to look at it. Remember the episode about major and minor interactivity? In that episode, I made the point that video games could make something more powerful in a story without necessarily allowing the player to actively alter the events of that story. The same principle applies here to the independent protagonist. Well, let's see, it's, it's hard to use good examples of this without giving spoilers for one thing or another. I mean, I could, I could definitely mention the ending of The Last of Us or the 2008 Prince of Persia reboot. Uh, heck, I already name-dropped Shadow of the Colossus. Oh, oh, I know. I can't reveal all the details surrounding this event because, again, spoilers, but Final Fantasy X features a long segment of gameplay on the approach to a pivotal location and event in the story. This happens shortly after the protagonist finds out that this journey is theoretically going to end in tragedy, but the other characters are determined to see it through. The resulting sequence is a long walk with a single, beautiful song playing in the background of both the exploration and the battles, and it's a gorgeous and emotionally conflicting sequence. It's all possible because of the fact that we, like the protagonist, don't actually want to take this journey. We'd rather just turn back. But the protagonist has a very deep connection with the other characters, and one in particular, and supports them no matter what. We're being forced to do something we may not want to, because the protagonist does. Similar to his own situation, really. 
So see, in this context, we're being put further into the main character's thought processes by way of being forced to do something, regardless of whether we necessarily want to, because it's what they would do. There's something very strong to be said for the ability of interactivity to put us through a character's trials and make us live through their decisions, even if we didn't make those decisions or don't even agree with them. So really, this kind of character is just the same as characters in any other storytelling medium, but interactivity, as it often does, puts a bit of a spin on how the story is presented in video games and what it means to us as players. Another interesting topic is how these two different types of protagonists can intersect, which gets really interesting and really complicated, but for now, we're running out of time. So instead, we're just going to see a lot of various mixtures of story-defined character development and player agency as we go through this series. So for now, just let me know what you think of the basic ideas here in the comments. Next week, we're back to literary analysis. This time, we're going to be talking about Portal, and how it uses environments to tell its story, as well as how it integrates a tutorial into the game without compromising its storytelling. So, until then, class dismissed.